grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For our sermon text this morning, we read uh, verses from 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4. We begin at verse 10 of chapter 3. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And we skip ahead to chapter 4, verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, your fellow redeemed. So this will be a a different kind of sermon this morning. And that's because we're going to talk about the Supreme Court decision of June 26th at which the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage for all 50 states in our country. And it's interesting that pastors in our fellowship and the presidents of our fellowships, both the ELS and the Wells, and other church bodies like the Missouri Synod, and especially the president there, have all made statements about the Supreme Court decision, sent out prayers for churches to pray. In other words, they've made a big deal about the Supreme Court decision. Now usually, we do not say too much about anything that the government does. But sometimes there comes a point when the church has to speak out. And the time has come. And the reason we say that is because this institution of marriage is an institution that God created, that God defined. Not only for just Christians, but every single man, woman, and child for their good for the good of society, for the good of nations. It serves as the foundation for any civilized nation. Marriage. One man, one woman. Till death do they part for the purpose of loving and honoring each other and for raising children. That is God's definition. As I've said to you before, God is saying regarding marriage, this is mine. It's my idea. I created it. I define it. But now, in our society, and especially with the Supreme Court decision, man is saying, no, it's not yours, it's ours. And therefore, we can define it how we so desire. And so a lie has become the basis for what is now a constitutional right in our country. And the question is, does it really matter? 
After all, marriages and families have always struggled throughout the history of the world, sometimes more so in certain places at certain times than others. Now, marriages and families have always struggled with premarital sex, bed hopping by spouses, cohabitation, divorce, homosexuality, out of wedlock births, even though they have all continued to recognize marriage as is to be between one man and one woman. In America, even though the change in the legal definition of marriage has come about rather quickly, and what I mean by that, it's, it's happened within the last 13 years actually, beginning in 2002 with one state changing its definition of marriage and then several others and then it wasn't until two years ago that a bunch of others were changing the definition of marriage and now of course with the Supreme Court decision every state legally has to recognize this new defi definition of marriage. But the point I'm making is this, even though this new definition has, has come along rather quickly, we have been messing with marriage and undermining marriage in our society for 55 years. We have done some really stupid things that have diminished the value of marriage, God's institution. In the 60s, we had the sexual revolution, which started to give us the idea that you can separate the act from the estate of marriage. Free love. Also followed by no-fault divorce laws, where the government essentially said, let's make ending this sacred institution of husband and wife very easy for people now. And so the divorce rate went from about 5% all the way up to 50%. And of course, that was accompanied by living together where marriage is no longer considered to be that big of a deal, where it's not that important. And of course, out of wedlock, births increased dramatically so that now in the inner city, you have 80% of all births outside of, of wedlock because of the breakdown of marriage and the family. In the 70s and 80s, we had the growing celebration of homosexuality as an alternative and as a normal lifestyle. And then finally, the growing acceptance of same-sex marriage that reached its peak with the Supreme Court decision. But if you think about it, each of these steps was a step down. Distancing our society from the sacredness of marriage. Each of these was like a, a, a knife wound trying to put to death what God has created for our good. And back in the days of the Roman Empire, there was a, a ton of sexual immorality, especially by some of the Roman emperors. But marriage between man and a woman was recognized as important and necessary for the good of the empire. And so it was encouraged, it was protected, in spite of the fact that there was all kinds of sexual immorality. They were basically saying, we still need this institution for the good of the empire. But now, our society and our government, over the last 55 years, especially with the Supreme Court decision on June 26th, is essentially saying, you know, we don't need this institution. Let's have people change how they think about it. Let's undermine its sacredness and its usefulness. Let's promote the idea that it's not all that necessary. Let's dismantle it. Let's encourage the disintegration of the family. Let's open the door to all kinds of sexual immorality. And the point that we have to understand here is that they're doing so by by policies, by laws, and by rulings of courts using now the highest court of the land. And it's all a lie. Now, of course, man can never destroy marriage. Natural marriage is natural. It's written on 
man's heart. And so by nature, we, we know that it's good and that it's right, even if we don't treat it with great respect, as we should. And so the question is, can we turn things around? Well, perhaps God will have mercy upon our country and bring our nation to its senses. But we don't know, but he prayed that he will. A question here. Because of all that has gone on, gone on and has recently taken place, what, what's going to happen? Well, society or culture in general will greatly be affected. The great Lutheran theologian of the 20th century, Hermann Sasse, who lived in Nazi Germany, saw this very clearly. Uh, almost better than anyone else, you might say. And he saw what was happening there in Nazi Germany with lies infiltrating the society and the government. And he saw what would happen even before it happened. And this is what he wrote. The most powerful nations of the world have been laid waste because of their lies. History knows of no more unsettling sight than the judgment rendered upon the people of an advanced culture who have rejected the truth and are swallowed up in a sea of lies. Where this happens, life in marriage and family, in the state and society, fall sacrifice to the power and curse of the lie where man can no longer bear the truth, he cannot live without the lie. Where man denies that he and others are dying, the terrible dissolution of his culture is held up as a glorious ascent, and decline is viewed as an advance, the likes of which has never been experienced. So he was describing American culture today as well. In other words, he saw the lies embedded in the totalitarian government and the thinking of Nazi Germany, and he predicted its fall three years before World War II even began. In other words, any nation, no matter how advanced, that denies basic and necessary natural truths, especially the foundational truth of marriage and family that God has established, will not last. So, we may be seeing the beginning of the end of this great nation, but God yet still may be merciful and turn us around Well, what else is going to happen? Persecution. And we've seen this already. Not to the point of shedding of blood, but other ways. If you say, here I stand on this teaching of marriage, there's a good chance you've already experienced some degree of persecution. Christians who have said, I can't support same-sex marriage have been called names. In fact, the, the courts have said they are really guilty of discrimination. They've been called bigots and haters and racists, and their reputations have been damaged. In recent years, many people have, in fact, lost their jobs. Some Christian business owners have been forced to close their doors. Some have been fined. I know a number of you have read about the, and this is only one example of many, but you've heard about that bakery out in Washington where they would bake food for anyone, heterosexual, homosexual, but then of course they were asked to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding celebration, even though same-sex wasn't legal out there yet at the time. 
and they politely said, no, we, we can't support that with our vocation, with our business. And so, of course, they were taken to court, and they are now fined $135,000. And the judge has ordered them not to speak about this publicly. And of course, this took place before the recent Supreme Court decision, which means that we can only look forward to more of this nationwide. What about churches? Are we in trouble? Well, we'll have to wait and see. And even though our very fine governor has said that churches and pastors will be protected, the heavy hand of the federal government because of the Supreme Court decision may overrule him. What about Christian colleges like our Bethany Lutheran College? Well, they will very likely be challenged in at least one or two ways. And what about our, our dear children? Well, they're gonna be pressured because people will call them names and they'll be threatened. They're gonna be pressured to change from a biblical way of thinking to an unbiblical way of thinking, to buy into a lie. But if they stand firm, they will be persecuted. As Paul says in our text, indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be Persecuted. So this is you know, par for the course in general for Christians throughout the history of the world, persecution. Now I don't want to paint too dismal of a picture here unnecessarily, but we have to know what is happening and what could happen. But in view of, of what is happening, and in view of what could happen, how do we as Christians respond? Well, first, we have what St. Luke writes in chapter 13 that is very important for us as Christians. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And so when we see terrible things going on in the world around us, whether the natural disasters or really bad court decisions, our response is not to be, oh, those terrible people. No, when terrible things happen, They are pointing to what? They're pointing to a sinful heart, which is first and foremost found here and in each one of us. We claim no moral superiority. We claim a sinful depravity. As we said just a little while ago, I, a poor, miserable sinner. But in repentance, we also claim grace. We claim forgiveness, full, free forgiveness, which means we're always directed to Jesus, who has taken away the sins of the world. As we sang in our hymn, in Jesus, I find rest and peace. We're safe in his hands, even though the world is full of sorrow and sins. In Jesus, I find rest and peace. So we respond with personal repentance. How else do we respond? We also respond by standing firm in our beliefs, steadfast, 
We do not cave to pressure. We do not compromise. We continue to believe that God's word and all that it teaches is true. But always we believe primarily that in Jesus I find rest and peace because all of God's word points to him. How else do we respond by living in repentance and standing firm on the teachings of scripture? Well, we will speak the truth when called upon to do so. But to speak the truth in love, or as Peter says, to speak the truth respectfully and gently. And as we do so, as we confess to others that this world, that the word of God and all that it says is true, we always and we primarily confess to them and speak to them, in Jesus, I find rest and peace. And so can you. Again, we say we're in safe hands. And they can be also. So what else? We live in repentance. We hold firmly to our beliefs. We speak the truth in love. What else? Well, if we have to face persecution, if we're going to be called names, ostracized, lose our reputation, lose our home, lose our job, lose our money, be fined, be imprisoned, or worse, we respond by commending ourselves into the grace of God, into the grace of God's hands. And that is, we continue to gather here as God's people to mutually encourage one another to receive the sacrament for our comfort and strength, to hear God's clear word, to hear, for example, Jesus say to us, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown before my Father in heaven. So, again, when we see terrible things happening in the world around us, we live in repentance. When the world says a lie is the truth, we remain steadfast in our beliefs. When society and our neighbor become greatly confused, we speak the truth in love. And when we are persecuted, we commend ourselves to God's grace found in his word and sacrament. For ultimately, as St. Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus, I find rest and peace. In a world that is full of sorrow and sin, in Jesus, I find rest and peace. We're in safe hands. Amen. Please rise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>